Hello YouTube and John Gary TV viewers. Thanks for joining us here on Q&A. This is episode six and I'm John Gary from John Gary TV. First of all, I want to thank all of our live viewers for joining us today. And uh, Adam and Mike are both gonna be standing by moder monitoring the chat sections uh, next to your video screen. I'm also gonna be checking in every once in a while to see what's going on. So say hello and ask some questions. We are, I'm super excited about this show uh, this week. We've been getting a ton of comments and questions since, uh, since our last show, and uh, we're gonna tackle a couple of those today. If you're um, not watching this live, if you're watching this later, uh, the recorded version, then you can still leave your questions and comments. That's what a lot of people do uh, for in our comment section, either on our YouTube channel or on John Gary TV on my blog where I repost this later on after I write a blog about it. And uh, you can write it in the comment section in both those places. And then I will try to get to those questions. We have been getting quite a few. I'm not gonna get to all the questions and comments we got since last week, but there were definitely a couple that were, uh, that a lot of people said, so I wanna get, um, at least cover those for this week. Um, you can also just email me at info at johngarytv.com and, and you can send your questions that way as well. All right, so we, like I said, we've got a really great show uh, for you today. Before I get to reading some of the questions and comments, uh, let me tell you first that we're also going to have our special populations correspondent, Melanie Byford Young, back. She's back for our segment, Questions I'm going to Ask Someone Else to Answer. Uh, so this time she's going to be talking about hip flexors, and we're going to get to that in a bit, but before she just gets to all the really fun ones. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to talk about a recap of this past week on John Gary TV. Uh, first of all, we uh, shot a couple videos, like we do every week, uh, some really fun classes. One of them, the first one we shot on Monday was Reformer Lower Body and Core Workout. This uh, was another workout that I took Mike through, and again, it is about an hour long. There is a ton of really cool content in there, and it goes along with the video that we shot the prior week, which was the Reformer Lower Body one. So um, if you haven't had a chance yet to check those out, check those out, and of course on our website, we also give you the notes that you can download, so you've got a couple classes right there for you. Then on Wednesday, I did a video called Pilates Mat Work with a uh, band circle and ball. Those were the three pieces that I used. Uh, super fun, lots of really uh, uh, um, innovative, I think, fun uh, content in there. And uh, so check that out as well. That's about a 30 minute workout. So that's a really good one to add to something else that you're doing. Or you can, I uh, don't typically do a ton of reps, so you can just add some more reps or a couple sets of something and you can make that into a whole class on its own. We also, tomorrow, will be uh, publishing day five of my personal strength training program. And day five is lower body and a little bit more shoulder work. So check that out. Uh, I'm doing a program called Take It Off 2017 and I've been working really hard. I'm doing a strength program, also some cardio work, some nutrition, of course. Uh, and so if you are interested in, in following me as I get ready to do another men's physique competition in June, you can do that on our website. You can just go right to, um, there's a program called Take It Off and you'll see that under special programs. And you can go there and you can follow along and uh, join me, come join me, come to Riverside and take it off. Okay, so uh, that's enough of that. Let's get back to our special populations correspondent. So Melanie Byford Young is a uh, Pilates instructor and more from P Pacific Northwest Pilates in Portland, Oregon. And uh, this week, Melanie is addressing a question that we got from quite a few of our viewers, and it is about hip flexor issues. So Adam, we're ready to roll the tape, roll it. Hi, John, it's Melanie Byford Young. Thank you so much for inviting me back to address another one of the age old questions in movement sciences. So the question that we get to discuss today is, why are so many people's hip flexors tight? And then what can we do about it, especially when they don't respond to any of our traditional stretches or lunge stretches that they don't change over time? That is always your first indication that really something else is happening, that you are misusing and misloading those hip flexors, and that's at the root of the issue. So um, I'm going to suggest three main things to look for and start to unwind through movement. 
So the very first one, of course, is when you're looking for rotations, either of the rib cage on the pelvis or the pelvis on the feet. So we're looking to um, see, is that rotational instability leading to the hip flexors having to hold on and try and compress your pelvis down onto your femur or, or just block that motion? So if that is the case, it can be pretty subtle, but um, things that I would look at doing would include, of course, um, spinal rotation. I would look at doing some side bends, some mermaid, some of the kneeling work, uh, some rotation prone on a chair, anything where we can start to rebalance the a relationship of the pelvis and the rib cage. And then when we're looking at things like pelvis on the feet, things that we could do like seated in the archer so that you're sitting on a rotational disc and then rotating the pelvis side to side. That's a great way of starting to get the pelvic floor and the lateral hip muscles and the adductors as well, all those flexors that are working um, and trying to bring them back symmetrically. And then things like footwork on the chair, footwork on the reformer, those are all great ways of starting to restore that relationship. So another thing that we look at, of course, is postural deviations in the sagittal plane. So any sort of sway back or kyphosis lordosis will misload tensor fascia lata, the glute min, glute med, the adductors, and of course, rectus femoris in the sartorius. So if you've got a sway back where the pelvis is sitting forward um, underneath the rib cage, or rib cage is shifted backwards, in other words, um, doing a lot of work in side lying and supine, starts to re-educate the erector spinae and the, um, the oblique, especially the external oblique, trying to change that relationship. But you very much have to address the iliopsoas and get it back to being a vertical muscle as opposed to a kind of a zigzag muscle. And we need to do that with things like keeping your spine still while you do leg slide, doing a squat and learning to come up out of the squat without just the lumbar spine pulling. And in other words, compressing in through those hip flexors again. A third thing that we can really look at of course, is mobility of the feet and managing what, if somebody is gripping in the feet and is losing shock absorption, they're probably also going to be gripping in the hip flexors. Um, alternatively, if somebody's gripping the external obliques, that downward pressure will also be, will have a response of gripping in those hip flexors. So you can always look at those uh, other mechanisms and try and restore with breath and with um, any big global movements to try and unwind those, those um, habits, as well as restore new habits and uh, get the glutes firing. Always, always, always. You can't just overpower grippy hip flexors with grippy glutes. So we need really great glutes to unwind the hip flexors and the need to compress. So uh, the summary, why do people have grippy hip flexors? For a lot of different reasons. And especially if they don't respond easily with lunge stretches or side leg lift, things like that, then really look for the rotations, look for the translations in the sagittal plane and look for bracing tendencies throughout the entire body. I hope that this helps, and I hope that you'll actually find some really, really quick results by kind of looking globally at what is the root cause of hip flexors. Have a great show. Take care. Thanks so much for inviting me. Again, it's Melanie Byford Young. Bye. Thank you, Melanie. That was great. Okay, so, all right, let's move on here. Um, I actually, I can't hear her when she's doing it the way that our system is set up. Uh, so I just wait for Adam to tell me she's done and uh, I have watched it and it's I know it's really good But um, I never know I can't remember what she said at the end So I think she said probably thank you and I'm gonna say thank you. No, thank you. Okay, so <laughs> let's move on um, Anyway, if you want to see uh, Melanie in person Let me see where where I have that information Melanie is going to be joining us at John Gary Fitness and Pilates in Long Beach, California May 5th through the 7th, we are having our spring conference. It's a Stop Pilates CEC conference, so you can come and get your CECs. She's gonna be coming here and doing some rehab workshops, um, and she's super awesome, and uh, I'll be teaching that weekend as well, so I hope you'll come and join us. Come to sunny Southern California. Um, also, uh, speaking of sunny Southern California, I'm gonna be teaching at our first conference of the year. This is a new one for us. We're having a conference uh, from, uh, at our studio in Long Beach, California from March 10th to 12th. Again, it is coming up March 10th to 12th and it is a Stop Pilates CEC conference. Uh, I'm gonna be teaching there, it's a full weekend. Heather Lawson and Mary Jo 
uh, Ketterhag and Ida, all, both lead instructor trainers, are going to be teaching at that conference as well. We're gonna have workshops about active aging. We're gonna have workshops about athletic conditioning. We're gonna do some map-based ones and some reformer-based ones as well. So I hope you'll join us for that. There's still space available, so you can sign up for that um, on our website, johngarytv.com, or just get in touch with, uh, actually, johngarryfitness.com is where you sign up for that one, or just call our studio. If you have any problems, just email. All right, or leave a comment and we'll get to you, <laughs> okay? so. Uh, also, I want to make an announcement today. I just found out and I am super excited that I am going to be presenting at the Pilates Method Alliance Conference this October 25th through the 28th. Uh, really excited to be there. I haven't been there in years and it's going to be super fun. Uh, let me know if you're coming to, uh, to do workshops there. I would love to meet you. Not only am I going to present, be presenting a workshop, I'm also, we're also going to have a booth so you can meet me and Mike and Adam. It's going to be super fun. We'll be there all weekend and uh, I would love to see you there. This is, this is going to be such a cool event for us. Uh, so, and I just found out that I got accepted to teach there. So I'm really excited about that. I hope you'll join us. All right. So. Uh, now I want to uh, cover, this is going to actually take the rest of the show. I'm going to cover a request I've, I've received from a couple of our subscribers. And um, I want to I want to mention a few of them. Uh, the first one is Sinead. And Sinead says, I'm, uh, I'm so happy to have found John Gary TV. I love, love, love your reformer workshops. I live in Ireland and completed my intermediate reformer course and intend to sit my exam soon. I'm very nervous about the exam. It's my first one. Uh, so I'm doing lots of studying and watching videos. Any advice for someone sitting their first exam? And that's from Sinead. Sinead, I'm going to answer that in one second. Uh, and now I'm going to read, oh, I totally meant to look this up, but now I'm going to read uh, another email that's along the same lines, but has uh, more requests in it from, how do we say this? Hans. Hans from Hans. We think it's Hans. It's J-A-N-S. Um, and he's from uh, South Africa. So this is what he said. Uh, I'm a level one Stott uh, Pilates trained instructor from Johannesburg, South Africa. And I really enjoy this platform you've created. I regularly use it for inspiration and as a reference tool. I'd like you to ask, the, I'd like to ask the following please. Number one, in preparation for my level one certification exam, are we allowed to log observation and physical re review hours by watching your workouts, especially the workshop videos and all the other videos you have done on mat work reformer and so forth. I feel that you have created such a great platform promoting Stop Pilates that we as students should be allowed to benefit from this too. Is it a win-win uh, for everyone? And I'm going to say yes right off the bat, but I'm going to get more into that in a second. This is his second part. Um, what tips can you give me regarding preparation for the exam? I have some learning issues um, and don't, don't know where to start because there's so much to learn. It is a really comprehensive exam. I also have my own studio, good for you. Uh, so to balance everything is really challenging. And I'm gonna get to that as well. And finally, here's the third part. There is something I struggle with regarding teaching. I'm a bit of a purist when it comes to Pilates and feel that part of the magic of Pilates is the sequence in which the exercises should be followed and the layering Stott Pilates teaches us. In reality though, I imagine that clients will get bored following the same sequence every time. My question is how do I as an instructor and studio owner balance the two? I really struggle with the issue. When I practice Pilates myself, I follow strict stop Pilates sequence and uh, with the necessary modifications. I find this the best because you can feel how, you're, how you improve and how you get stronger over time. I also have a better body-mind connection this way. Apart from that, I find it challenging every time, even at an essential level. Do I stick to my guns and train people this way or do I get creative? The question then is, is it still Pilates? I am still trying to find my style of teaching. I like to keep things simple. I like a certain routine and I like exercises to be performed correctly. I suspect you are the same in many ways. I watched your recent video on how to train new clients and liked it a lot. My way of teaching is very similar. I still always feel it's not enough 
and I'm scared clients will get bored. I would appreciate your assistance, your assistance in the above. Well, this is, these are really great questions and actually I get asked those questions frequently and I thought, Adam and I both thought that this would really be a great one to address for the rest of this show. Um, so the first, thing, the first thing I wanna address is whether or not you as a Stop Pilates trained student can watch my videos on John Gary TV and, uh, and do physical review to them and, and uh, use those as hours. And the, ac the answer is absolutely yes. Um, I'm a master trainer for Stop Pilates, uh, so you can use all of the Pilates that I teach um, for your observation and physical review. I want you to remember though, this is really important, uh, that when you're taking your practical exam, you are being examined by the Stop Pilates m manual material. The stuff that's in that manual is what they want to see. So don't do any, you know, if you've taken other workshops from Stop Pilates or you've watched any of the other content on John Gary TV that's not in your manual, it's perfectly fine um, to watch that and to enjoy it and to count it for observation hours, but you don't use that in your practical exam. They're looking to see how you teach the original repertoire. And so that's what you need to be focusing on for your exam. Um, so make sure you don't do any variations that aren't included in your manual, all right? Um, and that, it'll just make it easier for you uh, anyway, as you were saying, it's a huge scope of material to study. Um, the, other, uh, the other part of that though is that when you do watch the videos, you know, pay really close attention to the cueing, the correcting, the programming, because all of that stuff, uh, it follows all of the guidelines from Stop Pilates, and that's important for you uh, to be able to do as well in your own exam. All right, um, going along with that, I think you'd be really interested and it would be really helpful for you to look at one of the new special programs that we've just launched, which is training new Pilates clients. Uh, you, you mentioned one video in there, but there's a number of videos in there that you can watch and get some help uh, in terms of how do you introduce new exercises to, to uh, your clients and also some programming tips as well. So uh, check those out. And then uh, now let's get to part two. <coughs> Excuse me. Now let's get to part two, which is also what Sinead had asked, and that is, how do I have tips on preparing? Well, I have got a ton of tips on preparing. Actually, at our licensed training center uh, down in, in Long Beach, we um, have, uh, we have a, what's called On Track, which is a weekend program that people can take to prepare them for the, for the exam. And uh, it's super helpful, but not everybody has access to that. Um, so what I wanna do is go through some of the tips that, that I have found really helpful uh, for students over the, I, I've been uh, uh, part of the Stop Pilates program for uh, 16 years now. So these are, these are tips that I have found that are really helpful for students when they're preparing for the exam. Um, I am confident that you're gonna successfully sit for your exam um, and so let's, let's get through some of these here. So first of all, uh, remember that the exam has two portions to it. There's a written portion and there's a practical portion. Uh, and so you need to prepare for, for both of those. So I want you to start out by making, and I know this is huge, but I want you to start out by making a comprehensive plan for yourself. So we're gonna, let, me, let me talk about that in terms of the written uh, first. So the written portion, you're gonna set aside some time every day to work on your exam prep. If you feel that, okay, my day is already packed, I don't have another second in the day, then what I want you to consider is getting up 15 minutes to a half hour earlier in the morning, or if you're not a morning person, if you're a night owl, stay up 15 minutes or 30 minutes longer than you normally do. Just add that amount of time that you are uh, definitely going to only focus on your exam prep. Uh, and then of course you need to plan for time during the day when, when it's possible or weekends, there's always possibility, but you need to get a schedule together and you need to honor that schedule. So that's the first, that's my first tip because that alone is really going to help you along the way. Um, so once you do that, you want to, you want to get organized. So you want to already know what you're going to do when you're sitting down for that amount of time. And, uh, you need to be able to master, you put, put together a master program for the following things, anatomy and biomechanics, 
postural analysis, the basic principles, the exercises, and programming. So those are the components, those are the primary components of the exam, and that's what you're gonna need to prepare yourself for. So what I say is break them up into sections and uh, start, start working on them that way. And then you just don't worry about how much you have to do, just take it chunk by chunk and focus on that part that you're focused on right then and don't worry about anything else. When you learn that, then that's done and you can move on to the next step because you can easily get overwhelmed with this. So first, I would, uh, of course, start with anatomy. And in terms of anatomy, you're al already supposed to have some anatomy background or knowledge before you get into the course. But I know that a lot of times we haven't looked at that for a long time or you really need to brush up on it or maybe you didn't have as much as you thought you had uh, when you get into the course. So here's, uh, this can be done while you're taking the course as well and I recommend that you do it while you're taking the course, not wait until after in your exam prep. But um, the first thing to keep in mind is that Stop Pilates uses a very specific muscle flashcard system called Brian Edwards. So you need to get those because all anatomy photos are slightly different from each other. Is it time for a picture? So all, all anatomy uh, are, are slightly different from each other. So get the, those, are the Brian Edwards flashcards. And you wanna get those because um, those are really going to, those are really gonna th th be exactly the photos of what you see on the exam, all right? Now, there's a lot more muscles in that stack than you're actually responsible for knowing in the Stop Pilates repertoire in the exam. So in your support materials book, there's a page with all the muscles listed. So the first thing you're gonna do is pull out all of the cards from that stack that are in that reference book. And uh, once you do that, put the other ones aside. Someday you might wanna learn all the muscles of the eye, but maybe not today, all right? And that's usually not what we teach in Pilates. So, um, pull those out, put them aside, and then uh, begin by splitting up the remaining cards into body parts, all right? So muscles of the elbow, muscles of the shoulder, muscles of the thigh uh, or the knee, the hip, the muscles that act on each of those joints, and study them separately. So it'll really, now you've narrowed down that stack even more. And what you should do is use those cards as a quiz. Flashcards are awesome for studying. Uh, so what you can do, the picture's on the front, and then when you flip it over, it's got the name of the muscle, it's got the action, it's got uh, the insertion and origin points, and those are the things that you want to know. Those are the things that are the most important for you to know for the exam. Uh, so those are the things you want to highlight, and those are the things you want to remember. And then um, as you study, you're going to shuffle that little deck of the muscles that act on the elbow or the muscles of the arm, however, however small you want to make it, and you're going to... Uh, shuffle the deck and then you're gonna look at it, you're gonna flip it over, you can say it out loud. It really helps to actually say it out loud. Um, and, and then uh, quiz yourself and keep shuffling the deck because you'll memorize the order before you'll memorize the actual image. So make sure that you always shuffle the deck. And then when you're done with that section, go on to another section and do that same thing with the other section. When you finish those two sections, you put them together and you shuffle the deck so that you're always like kind of triggering your brain to come up with that answer no matter where you put it in that deck. And eventually, you're going to have that whole deck of cards memorized. You'll know all what every one of those images is. You'll know what the action is and you'll know um, what the origin and insertion is of those. And when you know the origin and insertion and the action, those go together really well. So that's why um, make sure you study those on the cards, all right? Then, uh, as a bonus, what I would do once you start to learn the exercises, because when you learn the exercises, what I'm gonna teach you is that you're gonna wanna know what muscles are involved in working during that exercise. When you go back and, and you review the flashcards, because once you're done studying them, you need to go back and review them. Use it or lose it, right? So um, it'll be easier for you when you go back, but you go back and at lunch sometime, whatever, you flip through those cards. What I want you to start doing is not just name the action of the exercise or name the action of the muscle, but come up with what exercise or exercises that muscle is involved in. And that's really gonna help you start to get the biomechanics part of that down. So that is my anatomy portion. Can you throw up a slide for review? Did, did we throw up a slide for review? Okay, you're throwing up that slide for review? Okay. Do, 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 do. All right, yeah, we good? 
And you can just pause on that slide <laughs> later on rather than me sitting here waiting. Okay, let's go to the next, let's go to the next section. All right, are we good? Yeah, we're good, okay. The next thing I would do is begin with the exercises. All right, so let's say you're sitting, uh, I think both of you said that you're sitting for reformer. One said, I think level one, maybe everything level one. The other one said, uh, definitely mentioned reformer. So. Uh, let's let's go with reformer. So the first thing I would do is pull out your reformer essential stop Pilates essential reformer manual and the video that goes along with it or DVD or if you don't however however you have it um, digitally. And then what you're going to do is pick the very first exercise. I want you to read the manual. I want you to look at the pictures. I want you to read the manual and I want you to read it. Oh, Mary Jo, one of our lead instructor trainers, says it great. She says read it like it's the best novel you've ever read and you don't want to miss a word of it. So you're going to read that exercise and then what I want you to do is immediately watch it. Watch that, that exercise as Moira teaches it on the Stop Pilates video. Then I want you to do the exercise, yeah? And then I want you to pretend that you're teaching the exercise. I want you to say it out loud. Imagine how you would cue that exercise through. What's the start position? What's the movement pattern? Where does the breath come in? Then what I want you to do, if you can record that, record that with your phone or whatever, and then play it back and see if you can do it to your own cueing, if it makes sense, or if there's something that you need to correct there. Hearing yourself back or watching yourself teach back is an excellent way to study. It's a really good way to learn the material, all right? Um, then. I would recommend that you at least cover three to five exercises a day. If you can cover more, cover more. But once you get more than, you know, more than between five and ten, somewhere, you're, you're going to start not to remember everything you, that you've learned. So keep it in chunks. Keep it in chunks. And then uh, review them the next day and then start with your next three or whatever. Uh, but once you've done that, you can also go to John Gary TV. And for almost all of those exercises, especially the mat ones and the reformer ones, I have done what's called a go deeper. And in the go deeper, I cover everything you need. An, uh, the proper form and execution, anatomy and biomechanics. The, uh, I give you regressions and progressions. Now you might not be able to use all of the regressions and progressions, but they'll be really helpful because I talk about how they work in with that exercise. Remember, Double check and make sure they're part of the Stop Pilates manual before you use those in an exam. For maybe the uh, person who's examining you doesn't know about John Kerry TV and, and hasn't seen that before, and that's not what you're being tested on. So make sure that you double check on that. But anatomy and biomechanics, proper form and execution, you're going to hear it again, you're going to hear it differently, and, uh, and, and then you can move on from there. Okay, so. If you happen to be teaching, and you should be practicing teaching anyway, what I want you to do is those three to five exercises are gonna be taught to every single person that you teach that day. Uh, so if you have five clients that day, or you have five people that you're, that you're practicing with or whatever, you're gonna teach it to every single person. You're gonna see what kind of modifications need to be made. Once you teach it, at the end of the session, go back and look it up in the manual, because this happens a lot, you get something a little bit off and then you teach it the next time, you teach it off again and then you teach it off again and then all of a sudden you think that's the way it's taught. So make sure you go back and review after you teach it, double check your work and score yourself, see if you see if you got a 10 out of 10. Okay, now, the, what's that? Uh, let me see, am I on to review? I think, uh, I think I have a tip. So you want to put the review up first and I'll talk about the tip while the review's up? Okay, so while you're checking out that review, I also want to give you a little tip. I recommend you make a flashcard for every exercise. You put the name of the exercise on the front and on the back, write down in your own words and make sure you're using the book, the manual for reference, how you would cue that exercise. What's, what's the initial movement? What, what happens next? What happens next? And double check your work, make sure you're correct. And then also put on what are the primary muscles that you use for that exercise? When you have done that, one thing is you're writing this stuff down that helps you to remember it really is a good memory tool. And then you've got new flashcards. Just use index cards, they're really easy to use. And you can quiz yourself with those index cards. You can actually shuffle that deck 
and you can do a few things there. Once you shuffle the deck, you can look at the first, uh, maybe you look at the back of the card and you see how the queuing goes and you see what muscles are and you try to guess what exercise it is. Flip it over and see if you're right and you can do it vice versa. See the name of the exercise, talk through the cues, talk through the muscular emphasis and see if you have that all correct. And then, and then you can move on from there. The other thing you can do with those cards is shuffle them up and then try to put them in the correct order. Because remember, Matt and Reformer have an order that you're going to want to, that you have to learn and that you're going to want to follow, especially in the beginning as a new instructor, because it really helps you. And it's built in that you're going to get all the movements of the spine and work the arms and the legs if you do that order. All right, next, study your support materials book. This is something a lot of people forget about, and that book is packed with information that you're responsible for. Read it through, cover to cover. I know the beginning part is kind of thick. Don't read that before bedtime. Read it when you're right up in the morning and you're wide awake, that whole uh, muscle section in the beginning. Um, I'm a geek, so I kind of like that stuff, but even for me, you know, I read a page of it and then I'm like, what did I just read? So um, take it section by section so that you, it'll sink in and you can remember it. The other thing is to start, use a highlighter. Highlighters are great. Now, some people end up highlighting the entire book, which probably isn't the best thing, but highlight the points that you think are super important so that you can go back to those and review those as you go through. And go through your homework. There's a reason we give you that homework. That homework is gonna show up again. So go through it. When you're in the course, you should really be making notes about what the instructor trainer says are the important parts of the homework. Study that homework, super important. Also, your programming section in there is awesome. It gives you everything you need for all the po typical postures that you'll see. So look through those. A lot of people miss that. And what you wanna pay attention to is um, on those programming uh, for, for different postures, general programming as well, I'll talk about that in a minute, but on the programming for different postures, it'll tell you kyphosis lordosis. There's a really cool paragraph at the top that gives you a synopsis of what that entails and then a paragraph underneath that for what modifications you would typically make for those clients. Super important for you to understand those two paragraphs. Underneath that, you're gonna see a sample workout or recommended exercises that you start with and then what you add in. What I want you to focus on is the difference between what you would do with a kyphosis lordosis and what you would do with a flat back posture and a sway back posture. So compare those against each other. What's omitted? What's included? Why is that? Super important for you to understand that. Don't miss that. That's a really good tip for you. Okay, so from there, uh, let me see where we are here. I think I got all those. Uh, I'll give you the last tip while we, while we do a review of that. So the last tip is, and you probably can guess it, create some flashcards for these. Put the posture types on the front of the card and put what, that, what are the common things you see in that posture, the typical things you see in that posture on the back and maybe which exercises you would wanna be sure to include which ones you might want to omit. Those are really good ways you get those flashcards going. You're writing it down, number one, number two. You're giving yourself quizzes throughout the day. It's super easy to do that and a really great way to learn. All right, now, uh, I think that's pretty good for the written component. Let me go through now the practical component. One of the things that you need to keep in mind the most in the practical component is what we want to see is how you teach. Yes, there's postural analysis that you have to do. Yes, there's uh, uh, the basic principles that you have to know. If you look at the scope of that though, that totals about 20% of your grade and the other 80% is how you teach, right? So yes, it's really important for you to be able to do that postural analysis. Remember in the Stop Pilates exam, you have to do it within 10 minutes that because otherwise it eats into the time of your teaching. Um, and we've really narrowed down what you have to look at in terms of posture to make it easy for you to get that done if you know it. So memorize the posture sheet for sure. That's in your support materials book. No, start from the ground up and memorize. I'm gonna, from the side, I'm gonna look at the ankle. Then I, well, I'm gonna look at the full body first. Then I'm gonna look at the ankle. Then I'm gonna look at the knee. Then I'm gonna look at the hip. Then I'm gonna look at the pelvis, blah, blah, blah. It's pretty much every joint you see up the side, right? So memorize that 
And then you also get a guide that comes with that that tells you what we expect, whether we want you to visually tell us what's going on or whether the, you'll see a little hand there, whether we want you to actually, there's something that you should be palpating to help you know what's going on there. So check that out. It tells you exactly what to do in the posture. And for, and I would say plan a posture day for your friends, for your family, if you're, if you have a studio already for your clients. So give people, you know, probably you're going to need to give them a 20 minute slot, especially if you're first starting out, cause it may take you longer than that, but you can schedule people back to back. The more people you look at in terms of posture, the easier it is to see differences between posture and things become obvious. When you first start, you're looking at it and going, well, I have no idea what that is or why I'm looking at it. But as you start to compare from one person to the next, it becomes really obvious when there are differences between people and what those differences are. So look at as many people as possible. It's really going to make that whole section a lot easier for you. Um, and so that's the posture. And then let me go on to the next part. What's that? Reviewing the posture now. Is that right? Yeah. So remember to time yourself when you're doing these postures too, you want to get it under 10 minutes, but trust me, family, friends, they love to be looked at. They love to be analyzed. So um, they're not going to say no to you. Most of them are not going to say no to you and the, and they'll put up with you going, hold on a second. I have to look at the book and see if I have this right. Okay. Basic principles are next. So the basic principles, Stop Pilates has five basic principles. We know there are the original Pilates principles. We all follow those. Those are really super important. But Stop Pilates also has the five basic principles. This is a slam dunk on your test, okay? Because you get a handout with all the points you need to make sure that you talk about during that portion of your practical exam. It's really important though, because those basic principles are going to be with you for the rest of your teaching career. They are in every single exercise. So we need to know that you have mastered those. So what you're going to do is take each principle, memorize the points on there. And then I want you to put that into your own words. Once you put it into your own words, before you even bother starting to teach somebody else, start to say them out loud, record yourself saying them and get that memorization down. Then know why you're saying each of those points. Get a friend, somebody who doesn't mind being bored to tears and take them through the basic principles until you've got them down. It really helps if you've got a, somebody else who was in the course with you or who's also preparing for the exam uh, because they can say, wait a second, you missed this point or you missed that point. The thing with the basic principles is that you want to be able to talk about them so easily that you can also take someone through an exercise because that's what's expected. You have to actually move them while you're giving those points. It's super, a little, it's a little bit tough to do in the beginning, but the reason it's so important for you to be able to do that is because we need to know that you can do that when you're teaching them. You're not going to be saying it out loud, but in your head, you're going to be going through all those points and saying, that's how you know what to cue and, and what to correct and what to tell people they're doing well. All right. So get that down. Got to be under 10 minutes, video yourself doing it. And guess what you should do with that? Make some flashcards, put the basic principle on the front, put the points on the back and quiz yourself a really good way. Do we need to put up a, a, a right? Let's put up <laughs> Adam made one for every single point. I actually, he said I made him make them. I don't know about make and made them, but I was really happy he did. <laughs> All right. Okay. And we're back and we're going to talk about actually practice teaching. So this is one of the most important things that you can do to prepare for your practical portion of your exam and for your teaching in general, teach as often as you can, as many people as you can. And one of the biggest mistakes people make is they start always at the beginning of the list and they're teaching and they're teaching and they're teaching. So the, and then, and then the, they run out of time. That's the end of this session. So the next session comes in and they start at the beginning of the list and they teach and they teach. Well, that's what we tell you to do, right? Start at the beginning of the list. But when you're learning and especially when you're working with the same person over and over again, give them a warm up and then start where you left off the last time. Start from there and teach until you run out of time. Then when you come back, Give the person a good warm up. Maybe do the first couple of exercises on the list because you're familiar with those. Start where you left off the last, the last time. 
and keep working your way through that list so you're not really, really good at the first half of the list and not so great at the second half of the list. You wanna be able to be good at the whole thing. So that's super important. And the other re recommendation, strong recommendation I would make is to video yourself. Watch yourself teaching. Are you standing in the same spot? Do you hold your hands in your pockets? Do you have your arms crossed? Are you using all kinds of cueing, tactical cueing, verbal cueing, uh, what else is there? Visual cueing. So all of those things are super important to show. You wanna be able to show all of those and make sure that you understand the exercises inside out and backward. When you're getting yourself ready for that practical exam, have a general program already done that you have practiced a gazillion times and then throw yourself a curveball. okay? You're gonna do a posture on somebody and they have a kyphosis lordosis. What exercises do you already have in there that are appropriate for that person? Are there any exercises that you have in there that you might modify? Which ones would they be and how? And what extra exercises might you throw in there to help with that particular posture? If you do that for every one of the postures that you see and for each joint that you know that what's going on, you're gonna be ready for that exam and pretty much anything that you see up there uh, when you do your postural analysis. All right, let me see if there's anything else. Uh, I think that's good, did I get everything? Yeah. I got everything. Record yourself. I talked about that. Are we showing it now? Yep. Okay. Um, review your video and score yourself. Score yourself honestly. Did you cue? Did you correct? Did you, were you actually teaching? Were you actually present with the client? Were you using their name? Did you have a positive teaching manner? All of those things are really important. And one of the biggest tips I can give you, if you're somewhere where there's test, where there's a licensed training center or hosting site, where you can be a body for an exam, volunteer to be a body for an exam. It's the best way to get that exam experience without actually being the one that's tested. Don't be a body for an exam though if you're not fully aware of every single exercise that's, that you're gonna be uh, tested on. Don't use it as your own um, kind of review session. Make sure that you're near the end of your process for getting ready to take your exam before you actually um, are a body for an exam because you wouldn't want somebody that wasn't that didn't know all the exercises to be your body right so make sure that you're a really good body for whoever that i know we call that the person the body but you're a really good um client for the person who's taking their exam and finally i'm going to say about the testing process stay calm take it in segments stay calm and remember to breathe okay so now Let's, that's this part two, believe it or not. We're gonna go to part three of that email. And part three, um, yeah, I can't even remember what it was about. <laughs> Do you remember what part three was, Adam? Before I read the answer? Oh, here we go. So, um, oh yeah. Should you stick to the Stop Pilates uh, curriculum when you're teaching clients, uh, or is it okay to do, do other variations or modifications, and is that still Pilates? Okay, so th this could be another hour conversation, but I'm gonna break it down uh, as, as briefly as I can. Number one, uh, I believe that Pilates is a philosophy. Yes, there are definitely exercises that have been taught, that were taught by Joseph Pilates that have been passed down through the years, but most of those exercises by most instructors have already been modified. If you look at videos of Joseph Pilates doing those original exercises, we do not do them for the most part. Most people do not do them the way he did them because we have all, uh, you know, we know a lot more about the body now than he knew when he created them. And the exercises are brilliant, but sometimes they needed to be modified a little bit to be safe. And so, Yes, I do think that whatever school you're studying with, and in this case, uh, the question was for Stop Pilates, you should learn that repertoire inside out and backwards. That is number one. You want to know the foundation, and that doesn't, that, it doesn't matter whether you're studying with Peak or Bazzi or whoever you're studying with. Know it inside out and backwards. Test, finish, know that you know the material really, really well. Um, and do it yourself. And, and I do like to do the original repertoire myself 
uh, at least once every couple of weeks, I do it that way um, to keep me, to make sure I'm centered, to make sure I know the information, to know, know, make sure I know where everything came from. Super important. But once you have that, um, you know, when I, I, I don't know, maybe some people can just teach that for the rest of their lives, but I need to expand. I need to keep learning. I need to keep uh, pushing myself and keep pushing the limits. So that's what I have done. And um, yes, I still call it Pilates because I follow the principles of Pilates when I teach. And I also still teach a lot of the original repertoire. So um, I kind of mix and match. And what I've learned is that you have to teach to the person in front of you. Kathy Corey says that, and I know she says somebody else says it. So I think that's kind of one of the things in the industry that, that most of us believe, and that's what Joseph Pilates said, is you have to really teach to the person in front of you. No two people are alike. So some people, yes, you're gonna teach every exercise in the repertoire, they're gonna love it, they're gonna master it, they're gonna to wanna to keep getting better at it, and, and that's gonna be really good for them. They're gonna get where they want to be with that. And then other people are gonna learn it, they're gonna come in, they're gonna be like, can we do something else today? Is there something, can you change this? Can you vary it? They, they need that kind of stimulus. They need that kind of change. And so you want to be able to adapt with that. Now, the exercises have to fit the person you're, you're doing them with. You have to know their body, you have to know they're safe, you have to know they're effective, and you have to know that in exercise inside out and backwards as well. So before you give an, uh, any kind of exercise to a client, know why you're doing it. Ask yourself, why am I doing this exercise? Is it just because it's different? Or is there a reason behind this that actually makes sense for this client? And for some clients, it might be they just wanna do something fun. So is the exercise safe? Is it effective on some level? And will it be fun for the client? Then yeah, do it, for sure, do it. But I always say, and I, we tell our clients this at the studio, go back and take, uh, we, we don't call them beginner, we call them pure reformer classes. We go back and take that pure class again. And I think uh, that um, what Hans was correct when he said that he can go back and do that essential work and it's really challenging still, maybe more challenging. The more you know, the better you are at doing the exercise, actually the harder those exercises get. So that's my advice. I say stretch yourself and move on. And uh, yes, and that, those were such great questions and I, I really appreciate it. Before, I wanna check in with Adam. We need a picture. We need a picture, okay. Should I, I should be taking my exam? I think Oh man, I have, a I have a question. Okay, oh, having a graceful dancer's body when performing the exercise. Oh, hold on. Hi John, I am PMA certified. So am I, hello. <laughs> and are subscribed to you here as well as your website and I'm curious on your thoughts on body love and having a graceful dancer's body when performing the exercises. Um, I, I'm not quite sure what body love is, uh, but I will tell you that I think if you're saying graceful dancer as in athletic, which I think dancers are extremely athletic, um, I think that's actually really good. I don't know if I look like a dancer when, when I do most of the exercises. Maybe in my mind I'm a dancer, but um, I do think that part of that mentality um, of, of really thinking of perfecting the movement and elongating through the movement. I think that's a, that's a really, really good way to think about doing the exercises um, and to perfect the exercises. So um, I, I'm not sure if I understood your question 100%, but that's how I would answer it. Also, you know, you want, I think as a, as a studio owner um, with, we have, um, in our studio we have fitness and Pilates and we have 150 classes a week. Not all of them are Pilates, but I think we have about 50 different Pilates-based classes on our schedule per week. Uh, plus, we do lots of privates. Not everybody is a dancer, uh, but there are a lot of athletes and there are a lot of people that uh, move differently. So they look differently, they, they move differently. Um, but yes, that whole idea of perfecting the exercise, how can you perfect it? And for some, that's going to be, you know, make it look graceful, make it look like a dancer. For some, it's going to be making it look super
super strong, but also um, fluid. So it, maybe maybe that's also dancer-like, but but I'm thinking more fluid than trying to point your toes a little more or something like that. Okay, so that's my answer for that. I hope that that. Um, uh, let me see. It says, please press Command plus Option plus W to fix the stream. I don't know what that means, but I'm looking at, right now I'm looking at the stream and it looks great. <laughs> so, so maybe it fixed itself. Um, and uh, we'll look into that. And if it didn't fix itself and that's a problem, then, uh, then we'll, try to, we'll try to figure that out for next time. Do we have any other questions? Is that it? <laughs> I think that's it. Let me look at everything. Oh, it's good. Yeah, I think I love this show. I think it's really important. And you know, I know I was focusing on the stop Pilates exam, but if you are PMA certified, all of there's not a practical component to the PMA exam, but there is a written component. And a lot of what's in there is based on teaching and based on the practical movement. Um, and so, you know, no matter who you trained with and no matter what method it is, my main thing for you is get certified. It shows, we, we want this profession to be at, at the top. And if we don't get certified, if we don't finish what we start, then um, you know, you're doing a disservice to, to, our, to our, and I mean all of us inclusive, our profession, and to the clients who come to see us. So make sure that you um, get the proper training, first of all, and that once you get the proper training, you get certified. And whether that's through the Stop Pilates system or PMA or any of the other programs that are out there, it's really important to finish that and really important to get certified. And I hope that this information about how to study in general, you can apply that to any of the programs. Uh, so that is it. Um, oh, we'll be doing my written exam tomorrow morning here in Toronto. We'll say hello to all my peeps up there at Stop Pilates. I miss those guys so much. You're welcome for the tips. You have 24 hours to get them all in. <laughs> you're probably, if you're testing tomorrow, I bet you're ready. So good luck. Let me know how it goes. I think it's, what is it, Martin? Yeah? Martin, let me know how it goes, Martin. Fingers crossed for you. All right, everybody, that's our show for this week. I really appreciate you watching it. I hope you'll tune in again next week when we're gonna have a lot more Melanie. Just wait, boy, do we have questions for Melanie. She's gonna answer them next week. See you then.